that was about 10 seconds. All right, hi everyone. I am Anna Kalbarczyk. I'm the Assistant Director of the Center for Global Health and uh, the director of this initiative, Women in Global Health Exploring Non-Academic Careers, which was launched last year, year before, um, and has featured um, a, a wide range of women leaders in global health. And we're very excited today to have Dr. Patty Michelle with us. Um, and who I will introduce very shortly. Uh, as you come in, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. You can say a little bit about where you are, your interests, maybe share your LinkedIn profile, but make sure that you select everyone in the chat so that your messages aren't just coming to me and Patty and uh, Megan, but that everyone gets to see and, and, um, and be introduced to you. Uh, some of you have mentioned in the past that you find the ongoing chat to be really distracting. So if that's the case, please just, uh, you can exit out so that you don't have to see it um, and just close that chat box during the seminar. If you have any questions for Patty, we will do a moderated Q&A session at the end. Please make sure that you add that to the Q&A function and not to the chat because we do have so many people talking and introducing each other and you know saying hello that uh, questions can get lost. So just please make sure that, that uh, those questions go to the Q&A box. And again, please, as you come in, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and select everyone as you do so. Okay, I now want to introduce our speaker for today. We're very excited to have Dr. Patty Michelle with us. She is a writer and public health specialist who combines her passions for women, technology, science, and the world to inspire children and adults through her writing. Drawing on her career in global health, Patty's works engage children and adults to wrestle with the toughest public health and societal issues of our time, including the anti-vaxxer movement, pandemic preparedness, and mental health alongside sexism and racism. Her writing also draws on her more than 25 years of work across more than 40 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Patty is also recognized as a pioneer in the field of mHealth and acknowledged for her roles as a thought leader, writer, researcher, professor, and executive. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides and turn it over to Patty. Patty, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Anna. And thank you to the women in global health. It's a real privilege and honor to be here with you today. Uh, as a woman in, in global health, uh, I really appreciate everything that this platform has been doing in terms of providing networking opportunities and opportunities for uh, learning and experience sharing. So, um, so really pleased to be here. Um, and I also really love that this series focuses on non-traditional careers because if, if nothing else, my career has been anything but traditional. <laughs> um, so to start, as Anna mentioned, uh, I am a writer. Uh, it took me a very long time to call myself that, uh, mostly because my dream has always been to write fiction, and I never really considered my academic writing um, or the writing that I did for work in terms of policy briefs, et cetera, to be writing, even though I have done a whole lot of writing uh, throughout my career. Um, and that's largely because as the, the daughter of immigrant parents um, from Egypt, uh, and I happen to also be good at math and science, I was always destined to become the family medical doctor. Um, but if I was going to be a doctor, I was going to be a doctor uh, in Africa. And so I started my, um, my professional journey really exploring international um, relations uh, and pre-med. Um, but I am getting ahead of myself. Um, so I have been a writer um, when I took a step back and, uh, and really reflected uh, on my writing um, as early as I can actually remember, like the physical act of writing. Um, but my very first book, um, at least the one that I remember writing, um, is the Babbling Brook Babbles On, which is a compilation from the seventh grade. 
Um, and I pulled it out the other day and I found this like really beautiful um, message from my seventh grade English teacher, uh, Sister Thomas. Um, and this is from, you know, June 9th, 1988. So I'm about to date myself. Um, and, and she wrote to me, may this be just the beginning of your babblings. My wish for you is that you will take this year's experience and develop it to the fullest. God has been very generous with you. I challenge you to do great things in writing. May I first see your first publication, prize-winning journalism, question mark. Um, and so I was really touched by that because I hadn't actually pulled that book out in a very long time and um, and to read that and, and just how encouraging um, it was. But at the time, because I was sort of this child of immigrants, we weren't going to do that. So instead, I really leaned in heavily in high school into uh, science and math. And, um, and as I was finishing, high school and getting ready to start my, um, my journey uh, to university, uh, I had a wonderful high school chemistry and physics teacher uh, who was from Liberia, Dr. Gadabaku, um, who really planted the seed for me uh, for a career in global health. And when I described to her what I really wanted to do um, when, you know, when I grew up, uh, what her response to me was, it sounds like you might be interested in working with the World Health Organization someday. Uh, and my response to her was the what, what, what organization? Um, and, so, uh, and so it was sort of that seed that, that got planted for me just as I was sort of going off to, um, to college and really trying to figure out kind of what I was going to do. Um, uh, et cetera. And so I had the great, you know, privilege of doing my undergrad at, at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and while I was there, I took this winter session course on careers in international health. Um, and it was in, you know, that winter session course that I was like, that is what I want to do. Um, that is exactly what I want to do. And so, you know, it took a few years, um, you know, taking the MCAT, which is the entrance exam for medical school, a dozen medical school applications, and a 1 a.m. phone call to my parents to break the news to them that I was not going to be a medical doctor, um, but rather I was going to pursue this career in international health. Uh, and, and I remember my, my dad saying into the phone, We'll talk about it in the morning, Habibdi. Um, and, and my response to him being, okay, mom and dad, but I am not going to change my mind. <laughs> um, and so, you know, fast forward, I, I took a year between my undergrad and grad school um, at the guidance of Hopkins to spend a year uh, in Kenya, uh, in a village in Western Kenya. Uh, and I taught elementary school and just had an amazing year um, it was one of the hardest years. Teaching is hard. Uh, kids are, you know, when you're dealing with kids and all of their developmental issues and challenges, et cetera, and growth uh, alongside academics, um, you know, I, I really want to take a moment to just commend everybody who is uh, in the teaching profession because it is not easy. Um, but when I came back from teaching in Kenya, I, I remember my first conversation with my advisor at Hopkins, Peter Winch, um, and I proceeded to tell him that uh, under no circumstances, um, even though Hopkins was really well known for research, that I was destined to not do research, but really what I wanted to do was design and implement public health programs. And of course, what did I end up doing for the next two years? You guessed it, research. In Egypt, uh, I went for a four-month internship and stayed 
for two years. And I discovered that I really liked research, not so much the actual doing of the research, but more what the research could do. That, you know, the study that I worked on in Egypt really formed the basis of Egypt's maternal, newborn, and child health policy for the next 10 years. And that was really exciting for me to see how, you know, doing this sort of in-depth study on perinatal and neonatal health could then ultimately lead to this national policy, which then ultimately led to these really significant reductions in uh, child mortality and morbidity, neonatal mortality and morbidity. Um, uh, and that was really cool uh, to have experienced that so early on in my, um, in my career. And so a year later, I ended up in uh, volunteering in, in South Sudan and in Baha Ghazal to help rehabilitate uh, an old teaching hospital. Uh, and so, you know, there were three things that happened during my time in Sudan that really led directly to my research and work on mobile phones and health. But then also, ironically enough, you know, 20 years later, fiction writing. Um, and so, so the first experience was really an unfortunate one. Um, we had, you know, at the time, uh, one of the only vehicles in the area and a two-way radio. Um, and I remember getting, you know, a knock on my door in the middle of the night um, from the nurse midwife from our clinic. And she, you know, came to me and was like, Patty, we have this woman, she is 16 years old, she is delivering twins, it is a complicated delivery. I don't think I can do this alone, we need to take her to, you know, the local hospital, which was like a four hour drive, and, you know, over barely what you would call roads. Um, and we need to radio to make sure that the only OBGYN in you know, that part of Sudan could be there so that when we arrived with this woman that he would be there to help facilitate the, the delivery. Um, and so all of that worked out. We got her to the hospital, the babies were delivered safely. Um, and then, you know, unfortunately a few days later, we received news that the, children and the mother had died. Um, but what it did for me was that it really underscored the need for communications, that emergency communications is a really important part of access to health services um, and, uh, and access to care. And so at the encouragement of one of my mentors, um, who I think you know regretted not having done her own um, PhD, she she you know was like Patty. We were talking. She's like, you need to do a PhD. I am writing recommendations for you to PhD programs. Let me know where you want me to send them. And I think she had regretted not doing her own PhD, and she really just wanted me to do a PhD. And I. I had never thought about doing a PhD, but I was like, but if I did a PhD, I would kind of want to look at technology and health. And I think I really want to look at mobile phones. Um, and so I ended up applying to a couple of programs. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that journey in a minute. Um, but before I go, two other things happened in, in South Sudan that really helped shape a lot of um, you know where I've gone, uh, where I've gone since then. Um, the second big thing was that you know, emboldened by my experience in Egypt, I decided it would be a great idea to do a household survey in in South Sudan. Nobody had ever done one before, um, and so we ended up doing a household survey in 1,100 households by hand because there was no electricity, computers, or anything. And so, uh, so I ended up training this group of nine uh, boys who had finished 
uh, standard six. So basically like a sixth grade education, but they could read and write in English and Dinka. And so we co-designed the survey. We went out and conducted the survey uh, in households in, in, in Southern Sudan. At the time, there was an outbreak of unknown illness um, that had been running through South Sudan that was causing a lot of um, death and paralysis of entire households. Like it was, you know, it was impacting a household and you would end up with like three or four people within the same household, all getting really sick and, um, and many of them, many of them dying. And so as part of this household survey, we ended up mapping the, by hand with the communities, you know, where the disease was uh, impacting people the most. And so we had put out a request to WHO and to CDC uh, for emergency support to come and really help us figure out what was going on. Um, and so they came and within a matter of like hours of just looking at our maps, they were able to identify that the, the disease outbreak that was impacting you know, this area was relapsing fever caused by a body lice. And so the response to this was actually from a public health perspective, quite straightforward, that you treat the relapsing fever with antibiotics, that you in, in households that are affected, you take all of the clothing and the bedding and you put it in the sun to kill the body lice. Um, but what was also happening was that because it was a fever and because in Dinka culture, when people have a fever, they withhold water. Um, so they had this traditional practice of withholding water for fever. What was, what was happening was this sort of paralysis um, and severe dehydration of, uh, of individuals. And so, um, so as a response to this, um, we kind of you know, brainstormed and decided that the fastest route to get information out to as many households as we possibly could was going to be through the schools and through the churches. And so, uh, so I ended up writing a children's book um, to help teach kids what this was and ways that they and their families could identify it and treat it and uh and respond to it um and and so that was you know my my second book <laughs> um and so and and shortly after that experience i ended up applying to do to do my phd at the encouragement of uh of adisa douglas and I applied to two programs. I applied to Hopkins and I applied to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, mostly because I just thought it sounded cool, not because I knew much about the school itself. Um, and I always just assumed that I would go to Hopkins. So I get into the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and get this like wonderful letter from uh, Dr. Simon Carter, uh, who later became my advisor. Um, who was a science and technology studies sociologist who, when he saw my application to do a PhD looking at mobile phones and health, was over the moon. He was like, you have to come here. I really want to be your supervisor. You know, let's, let's do this. And then I went and I met with Peter Winch again, and, uh, and he kind of looked at me and was like, you know, uh, Hopkins is not really ready for a PhD on mobile phones and health. And so if you've gotten into the London School and you like your advisor, you should probably just go to the London School. Um, and so that is what I ended up doing and um, which was great. And so, um, and, uh, and needless to say, Hopkins now has like one of the biggest M Health initiatives and programs, you know, in the world. Um, 
but they were not quite ready at that time. Um, and it's quite likely because at that time, mobile phone penetration in most low and middle income countries was like two to three percent at best. So, um, so I don't even think I was anticipating that it was going to become this sort of like huge field. But I was like, if I'm going to do a PhD, I might as well do a PhD on something that's going to be interesting to me. And so here we go. Um, and so from 2001 to 2006, it was a lonely journey. It was um, nobody else was looking at mobile phones and health. And um, there were only a handful of other people that were looking at mobile phones and development uh, in general. Um, and so, you know, it was it was one of those things where I was just kind of like, okay, like keep going. This is really interesting. Even if you don't use it, at least like, you know, doing the PhD, you'll get all sorts of skills from this process, you know, um, go for it. And, but then as I was doing, you know, more and more research and started to come across some early women pioneers in mobile health, um, namely Holly Ladd at Satellife, um, who was doing some really interesting things on, uh, on Palm Pilots. Does anybody remember what a Palm Pilot is? Um, you know, it's, it's a electronic device. <laughs> so it predates mobile phones where you can upload information onto a screen and kind of read on the screen. It was about this big. Um, wonder if I still have one. I should like, pull it out at some point. Um, and so she was working at the time to put health information onto Palm Pilots for health professionals and health workers in low and middle income, in low and middle income countries, um, which was really, you know, one of the first, um, you know, programs to, to, to do that. And then Rose Donna at the Red Cross, and she was doing really cool work on Palm Pilots um, to collect data. Um, and so imagine my 1100 household survey that we did by hand, you know, being able to collect that data on a mobile device and, and be able to process it electronically. You know, um, you know, we look back on that now and it's, uh, I think we take for granted the fact that we all have mobile phones and that our lives are fundamentally different than they were, um, you know, back in, uh, back in those days. Um, and so I never really thought that I would actually get to work on mobile phones and health. It was sort of like this thing where I was like, this is interesting and cool. I'm just gonna like do my PhD and then I'll go back to working on, you know, maternal and child health or HIV and, you know, and continue on my, my global health, um, you know, my global health career. And, um, but I had a chance encounter with uh, the head of the Global Observatory for eHealth at the WHO uh, at a conference in Luxembourg, uh, Yunka Kwankam, uh, who, when he found out about my research on mobile phones and health, uh, he was super excited. And he asked if I would be interested in doing a landscape uh, of mobile phones and health in low and, and middle income countries. And so I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I would love to do that. And, uh, and for WHO, how amazing is that? Um, and so I, I really felt like Dr. Gatabaku in that moment was you know, somewhere smiling. Um, I hoped her ears were burning um, because uh, I had this great opportunity to um, to do this landscape uh, with uh, with WHO, um, and at the same time as that was happening, I you know I finished my PhD, yay, um, and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next, um, and so in that I um, I just decided that I really wanted to live in New York City. And so I had grown up, I was born in New York, I grew up in Northern New Jersey, and I had always like in my mind wanted to like live in New York. And so I was like, if I'm gonna do this, like at any point in time, like 
this is probably a good time to, to do that. And so I reached out to everybody that I knew and their mother that was doing anything remotely interesting um, or related to the things that I was interested in or wanted to do. And, uh, and so Jonathan Donner, who I, I later collaborated on as a co-editor on M Health and Practice with, um, he was not a health person, but he was one of the only other mobile for development um, colleagues out there at that time. Um, and he was doing his postdoctoral fellowship at the Earth Institute on mobile phones and economic development. So mobile money in Rwanda, um, which was really cool and interesting. And he had uh, the very gracious, he, he sort of took my um, CV and my request and he passed it along to Jeffrey Sachs, uh, the development economist at the Earth Institute and it was a matter of like being in the right place at the right time um, because I get a phone call from, from Jeffrey Sachs um, at, I don't know, like 6 p.m. on a Saturday, inviting me over to his house on Sunday for brunch with the CEO of Ericsson, the cell phone company, because they are planning to launch this partnership between Ericsson, the cell phone company, and the Millennium Villages project in 10 countries in Africa? And would I be interested in a conversation about applying what I learned through my PhD research to this collaboration that they were about to, um, about to start? And, um, and so, you know, for, for four years, I had this fantastic opportunity to work you know, in these villages to really understand like mobile phone behavior, um, as well as to, you know, design and pilot and test different types of interventions uh, within the health sector, but then across other sectors like education and agriculture, um, et cetera. Um, and, and we learned a lot in that, in that time. We just like threw a bunch of things at the wall to see what would stick. Um, and some things really, really stuck and other things failed miserably. And so, you know, it's, it, there is this sort of like philosophy that I've learned by working with a lot of techies of like fail fast, fail forward. Like no idea is too outrageous. If you can think it, it can be done. It's just a matter of like whether or not it really is going to make sense from a user perspective. Um, but you know, go for it. And so, um, and so we did that, and we had a great time, really starting to uh, experiment and document some of the early learnings from uh, what was becoming the field of uh, of M Health and. Um, uh, and so in that time, I had, um, I was invited to help with the, um, a Bellagio meeting in Italy at the Rockefeller Center um, on M Health. It was the first time that, you know, individuals were getting together from different walks of life. So we had like mobile network operators, we had, um, you know, NGOs, we had, you know, health professionals, we had academics, um, all coming together to, to really see if there was sort of like a there there uh, when it came to this sort of intersection of mobile phones and health. And it was, you know, when I, when I think about that sort of like lonely journey, and then I remember that sort of first ever gathering in Bellagio of 25 people to talk about mobile health, it was like pretty incredible. Um, to uh, to kind of be there um, in in those conversations, um, and out of that came the M Health Alliance and uh, and the M Health Summit, and so um, and these for me were really was sort of really my entry point into sort of collective action movements and um, and really trying to mobilize you know, people around a vision, around an idea, around a concept 
um, that, you know, for many, many years, people were like, what? Mobile phones and health? Like, are you studying how they cause brain cancer? And I was like, no, I am actually studying how we can use them to like improve access to services and information. And, um, and you know, and so after, you know, spending years trying to explain to me you know, like why I was doing what I was doing um, or what I was doing for that matter, um, to starting to see this like, oh my gosh, there are other people that are really interested in this doing exciting things and sort of coming, starting to come together, um, you know, around this movement um, to using technology, you know, responsibly and effectively um, to help improve uh, health outcomes, strengthen health systems uh, and, and all of that. Um, and so, you know, with that, I watched, you know, the M Health Summit go from, you know, an event, the first event we anticipated there being like 200 people and like 500 showed up. Um, and then the event just continued to grow and grow and grow and eventually to, to 5,000 people, and um, which was really exciting, um, but also quite daunting. I mean, I remember when I knew like the two other people working on mobile health and then like the three other people and then, you know, the 20 other people and then the 40 other people and the 50 other people. And then it became so big <laughs> that, uh, that it was hard to even like wrap my arms around it. And that was a good thing, you know, even though as, as the introvert in me was like, oh, but the community is getting too big. Um, it was like, no, like this is the way it needs to go. And this is really, really exciting. Um, uh, and important. And so, um, and so while I was at the Earth Institute, I had, uh, I was being recruited by the Alliance to come in and, and take on the, the Alliance. And, and I was just like, no, I'm like really happy doing what I'm doing. Um, but I decided to like, not sort of, um, you know, disregard the opportunity entirely. And I ended up having a conversation with my boss at the Earth Institute. And um, so Joanna Rubenstein was a, you know, is a, a really close colleague and mentor. And, and her response to me in that moment, as I kind of enlisted her kind of thought power in my decision making, um, was quite brilliant. And, um, and so she, you know, her response was, I'm going to, I'm going to respond to you as your friend. I'm going to respond to you as your colleague. And I'm going to respond to you as your boss. Um, she's like, as your boss, I don't want to lose you. As your friend and your colleague, you need to go do this. And um, and so I, you know, I I did. <laughs> it was it was one of the first executive leadership roles that I've had in my career. The first thing I did was hire an executive coach to work with me because I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, um, and I need uh, I need some guidance and some uh, some help in sort of navigating this like whole new world of you know speaking in front of five thousand people <laughs> at the at the M Health Summit and and really mobilizing collective action, managing a team you know the size of which that I had never managed before and um, and all of that. And it was it was such an incredible and rewarding experience. It was hard. Um, uh, and then, you know, and then over time, uh, you know, the field grew and really matured. And then it became unclear whether or not the M Health Alliance made sense anymore. Um, and so we had to take a step back. We, we fortunately had a wonderful collaboration with the Norwegian government um, and they funded an external evaluation of the Alliance where it really showed that the Alliance had done a fantastic job of building this field, um, but that there were all these other organizations that were essentially now doing what the Alliance was created to do. Um, and the field was growing and transitioning into digital health and where the needs were was more in the, you know, country, you know, development of country strategies and policies, um, and less so on kind of building the field. The field was built 
And so it wasn't a question about like, should we be doing M health anymore? It was more about how do we do M health and how do we do this at a country level and what sorts of policies and strategies and capacity are going to be needed at a country level. And so out of that came, um, you know, we had a, a program, a capacity building program based out of South Africa. And we took the unfinished business of the M Health Alliance. Um, and, and Peter Benjamin and I co-founded Health Enabled. Um, and we kind of took the, un, you know, the unfinished business of the Alliance and designed the strategy for, um, uh, for Health Enabled based on that and really focusing on like nationally scaled integrated digital health systems and the enablers that were really needed and really positioning those digital health systems to improve health outcomes and strengthen um, and strengthen health systems. Um, and, and in that transition period, you know, one of my um, other mentors uh, really encouraged me to take a step back and to use that time to really reflect on where the field had been, you know, in terms of M Health, and then where this like new digital health world was going. And, uh, and so Ariel Pablos Mendez, who was at the time, uh, when I first met him at Rockefeller Foundation, and then he later became the USAID, um, uh, head of the the globe the Bureau for Global Health um, under under Obama, he encouraged me to uh, to apply for a Bellagio fellowship um, and to go spend some time at the Rockefeller Center in Bellagio, kind of documenting my experiences and then kind of charting the vision for like the next chapter of digital health, kind of based on those learnings. Um, and so I did. So I went and I you know I had this fellowship. Um, to go to, uh, to Bellagio. Um, and while I was there, this is the thing that I was so like, so unexpected, um, but has completely changed my life, was one of my like fellow fellows. So you know, you're in, when you go for a fellowship, you're in a cohort of fellows and, you know, it's usually, you know, 15 other fellows and they're all working on like a range of like really interesting things. And one of the other fellows um, was uh, Ruta Septus, who is a like New York Times bestselling young adult author. And, uh, and so she was giving, you know, her, each fellow had to present their work to the other fellows and there was like a question answer. When she presented her work, she did a reading for us, um, her publisher uh, and his partner happened to be traveling around Italy at the time. And so they came uh, and they came and they had dinner with us. And, um, and in conversation, I think I mentioned something about wanting to write fiction as a child, da, 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 da. And, you know, and I started talking, he's like, well, if you were to write fiction, then what would you write about? And so I started to describe some of what I would want to write about. And, you know, this intersection between, you know, public health and, you know, and the world and, uh, and all of this, but through, you know, through storytelling and, uh, and women in science and all that, you know. And so he basically looked at me and he's like, you're a writer. He's like, you need to write. And, uh, and so he pulled Ruta aside and, uh, and encouraged her to sit with me while we were still in Italy for like an hour or two. And just to like share with me her own Kind of like personal writing journey. And so Ruta had been, you know, she had successfully had her own music label out of, um, out of Nashville, Tennessee. And she kind of explained to me how she'd always wanted to write fiction and, you know, and how she kind of got started with her own kind of writing journey and just really encouraged me to, to give it a go. And so while I was in Bellagio, I wrote the first outline of my first novel, um, viral. And then, um, you know, and then fast forward, I've since like started a YA novel, you know, um, uh, called Loaded about school shootings that I pitched at a writing conference for, um, for young adults and children. And I was told by the agents, like, nobody wants to read a book about school shootings. So like find a new subject matter. Um, and so while I was there, um, there were a lot of marketing 
kind of conversations that were sort of happening um, on the main stage about how there was this real gap in middle grade fiction and in smart middle grade fiction. And so I was like, aha, I have a middle grade child at home. I should sort of mine him for ideas and, you know, and put on my kind of like medical anthropologist hat and, you know, uh, interview him. Um, and so this was happening at the very start of the, um, of the pandemic. And so we, so I, I did sit down and I tried to interview my child about, um, you know, about the, the pandemic and public health and da, 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 da. And instead of kind of answering my questions, he had like very strong opinions about what a story should be like um, if, if I really wanted to, um, to write something for kids his age. And so, so we turned it into a writing collaboration. And so I you know, have, have co-written this book um, you know, called The Antidotes with Gabriel. It, it draws very heavily on everything from Sudan to, you know, Egypt to technology, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and it's about a group of kids that, that come together um, to respond to a global health threat uh, started by a plastic eating bacteria experiment that goes bad um, and starts making fish and children sick. And so, um, so stay tuned um, for that. Uh, we're aiming to have it out uh, in, um, in the summer of, of this year. And we've started working on the second book, The Masters of Technology, which is about kids helping other kids become more uh, responsible users of, um, uh, of technology. And so uh, in closing to Sister Thomas, the brook continues to babble on. <laughs> and so I will, uh, I'll end there. Thank you, Patty, so much for sharing your journey. And I have to say the, um, the chat has been a flurry of activity. So I'll, I'll synthesize a little bit for you and then I'll, I'll ask the first question. We've been talking about coaching, how um, you, you know, engaging a coach when you got your first executive leadership position can, might also point to a lack of leadership training available for women throughout the stages of their careers. Um, how cool it was to be a part of something so novel at the time and what the equivalent might be now. What does that look like? Um, and then being an introvert, which you called yourself a number of times and also a leader. So I wanna ask if you could speak a bit to this last point um, and your experience for being an introvert in leadership positions. Yeah, so um, one of the things that happened as I was taking on the executive leadership role was this book came out. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this book. Quiet by Susan Cain. Um, and so I remember feeling like being an introvert was sort of this like curse. Um, but it's actually like a lot, as I've read more and more about introverts and leadership, there are a lot of leaders that you would never think of as introverts who are introverts. People are often surprised to hear that I'm an introvert, mostly because I can speak publicly and it's okay. And I'm not like falling on the floor or whatever, um, <laughs> or cause I can be social. Um, you know, when, when I want to be, but my preferred state is like me and the computer and me in a book and me and like a small group of people. Um, and, um, and so it is, it, it can be very hard to be an introvert in a leadership roles, but I think what you have to do is find ways to like build your energy and then find ways to engage with people that feel natural to you so that it's not like you're really being forced to do something that just doesn't come, that doesn't come naturally. I remember like one of the first things my coach did with me was the strengths finder. And, and she was sort of like, you lean into your strengths, you hire for your weaknesses and, you know, you, 
but you shouldn't try to overcome your weaknesses because the amount of time and energy that you will spend trying to overcome your weaknesses is gonna like take away from what you can do and, and really where you can shine. And so, um, and so what we did was we found the things that sort of came naturally to me. We blocked off time on my schedule so that I could have, like I wasn't in meetings all the time. We, and we discovered that my, like the thing that really works for me is to be prepared. Like if I'm not prepared, I just suck. And, and then I feel bad about it. So I'm just like, you know, and so for me, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's all about preparation and, and that feeling of like, I can do this. I've got this whether it's in a tough conversation that you have to have with someone, a management discussion, a board meeting, a, you know, opening remarks in front of 5,000 people. It, you know, for me, the real trick was just making sure that I went into it feeling like I had done what I could do to go in there and do what I needed to do. Um, I, I love that what you said about leaning into your strengths and hiring for your weaknesses. You know, I think um, we're so inclined to hire people who are like us, but that is doing exactly the opposite, right? And when we really think about that hiring for our weaknesses, it's just such a great, it's such a great lesson. Um, okay, I want, sorry, we've got so many questions. So this is fantastic. Um, Megan, Mary says, if you could redo your PhD journey, what skills would you try to develop during this period to better prepare you for your career? Ooh, um, that's a good one. So in, in my PhD, so I was really fortunate to have done my PhD in the UK. UK, UK PhD is very different than a US based PhD. And so um, in the UK, you apply with a research proposal and they attach you to somebody and they discourage you from taking courses. Um, and so what they really want you to do is spend your time on your research. And so, you know, um, what I don't think I did, which I really wish I had was I had this amazing advisor who was a science and technology studies sociologist who, you know, had me geeking out on like feminist theories of technology, domestication of technology, actor network theory, and like all of this stuff. And I think I would have spent more time in the theory than I did. I think I was like so busy trying to cut to the application that I didn't, I didn't absorb myself as much as I would have liked to um, in hindsight in, in the theory, because the theory, will apply, you know, it's it sort of, you know, in many ways, theoretical frameworks are evergreen. And, and I'm always looking for good theoretical frameworks. I'm always kind of like, what's a good theoretical framework for understanding this, or, you know, a good theoretical framework for understanding this other thing. And, um, and so I think it's really um, uh, important to like spend time uh, really like getting into uh, into the theory. And so if I were to redo my journey, I probably would have spent more time in that very like UK PhD, like luxury period of reading. Like they call it your reading period where you really do get to spend like, you know, a year reading. Um, oh yeah. So that's the co-author. Um, <laughs> who just talked, who just zoom bombed me. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. We always love having additional guests here. Um, okay, so we, um, we have a question about how you've messaged your skills throughout your different career paths. This is something that Amanda says uh, they're struggling with coming from a diverse background. So how to message your different types of skills. It's hard. It's hard. I feel like I've been more misunderstood than, um, <laughs> than than understood in my career. So I can definitely relate to that um, uh, to that question. Um, I think for most academics, I'm not academic enough, even though I am well published in academia and I've done stints in academia. For 
non-academics, I'm too academic. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things. I think, you know, the real trick is to really identify what, what it is that you want to be doing and working on and, and connecting with as many people that you know who are doing those things. Um, and then the words start to come out. Then, then you kind of start to figure out and you start to pay attention to like, how does this person describe what they do? And how does this person describe what they do? And, you know, um, you know, I remember one of the first times hearing the phrase um, architect and in the technology space. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's, a, that's what we do. Like we're digital health architects. Like we help kind of figure out what is the blueprint gonna be and what needs to be in place. And then like who needs to be involved to like get to the thing that we need to get to. Um, but it was through sort of like paying attention to and then just talking to people and, um, and, and really um, kind of honing that and then practicing it, right? So, you know, saying it a few times to see what comes out naturally or what doesn't. I remember like having to like go to um, like a, a cocktail reception and where I was gonna have to like introduce myself to a bunch of different people, cold, like cold, cold turkey, like had was not a part of that community at all. And, uh, and I remember the first few times I introduced myself, it just coming out really like awkwardly. And, but the more I did it, the more I was it, like, I could come up with the words that sort of felt like more and more natural for me to say them. Um, you know, and then as I became more comfortable saying these things, you know, sometimes people would say, well, what is that? Like, what do you, like, what do you actually do? And then you can kind of like have a conversation about it. Um, so it's not always like important to get it right. It's, it's sort of more important to like make it natural and feel right. And then, and then you can kind of dig deeper if people are really like interested and curious to learn more about like what that is. Yeah, I, I, well, I think that ties really nicely to, um, you know, you were saying earlier, you need to be prepared, right? So this idea of practice can be really important. And actually, I had just written in the chat, like, it takes practice, you you just have to try, try again. And then you said practice, I was like, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, you're not always going to do it right or well, and it's fine. Just keep, keep trying. Um, all right, Patty, since in our pre-conversation before you got online to give a talk, <laughs> you were willing to talk about work-life balance, which is a question I usually avoid, uh, but Lauren did ask the question, so I thought, all right, it's fair game. So uh, Lauren asks, how did you balance the needs of your career and the risks that you took to pursue new directions with the needs of your family and kids? What advice do you have for other mothers with professional careers? Sure. Um, so I, you know, I used to be one of these people who burned it at all ends. So I was like, you know, staying, uh, I was going to be super everything. I was going to be super mom. I was going to be super like executive director. I was going to be everything to everyone all the time. And, um, and so I would like work until like midnight and then wake up at 4 a.m. And, and then I would like block off my time for like my child and my family kind of in between that. Um, and then my office hours where I was like in the office. And at one point I just kind of was like, this is like not sustainable. And, and this, this sucks. Like I, I'm not doing like anything really well at all. <laughs> like I'm not, like I, I, I feel like I'm half baked when I'm home. I'm, you know, tired when I'm at work. I am, you know, and so I, you know, I had seen this interview with um, Ariana Huffington um, about how she collapsed on her desk, had a concussion and, and, and like woke up and was like, you know, like life can be very different. Um, and so I was like, well, maybe before I like fall down and like, knock my head on my desk <laughs> and concuss, I should, you know, take a page out of my public health world and do a little prevention and think about like, okay, what, what, 
what do I need to do? And what, what do I want my, my life to really look like? And, um, and I remember reading her book thrive and I, and I do make a lot of my, like all my coworkers have read it. Everybody that works with me has to read this book, but I remember like redesigning my like 24 hour, like life cycle and blocking off like in a pie graph and like, how do I want to spend 24 hours a day? And like, how much am I going to do sleep? How much am I going to do? You know, and, and in that I, you know, I decided that I was going to sleep eight to 10 hours a night and that was going to be boom, eight to 10 hours a night right there. And then I was going to spend uh, any waking hours that I could with my son um, and, and family. And so I just blocked that off because I knew what that was. Um, and then I was like, okay, there's the time that I will be, you know, in work mode. And what is that going to look like? And it ended up on my pie graph being six to eight hours. And so in that, I decided that I was just not going to work full time anymore that I was gonna to reduce to 75%. Um, and that even in the midst of all of that, um, because I had done my, you know, my wonderful like Bellagio fellowship, I was gonna start writing fiction. And so, <laughs> and I was gonna carve out some of my me time to specifically focus on like the pursuit of like that dream that was like my dream. Um, you know, fortunately, I have a really supportive um, co-parent that uh, has enabled me to continue to travel. Um, you know, originally, I thought I was going to have to give up the travel part of global health when I had a child. Um, and because he travels more than I do, um, and we both were able to navigate each other's travel schedules, I was able to kind of continue to travel um, uh, as part of my work, which is really what I love, um, you know, about global health is that you do end up meeting, you know, really amazing people and seeing, you know, what's going on on the ground. I think that has been the single hardest thing for me professionally during COVID is not traveling and feeling this like disconnect from the work and having to find ways to feel like connected <laughs> to uh, to the work that I'm doing. That really resonates with me. Um, since you came on and the first thing you said was that you love about this series that we explore non-traditional careers. And we have a question for you about non-traditional careers. I thought we would end with this one. Yeah. Uh, so Cordelia, Cordelia says, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Uh, she really loved hearing about your path and that she's been exploring communications and writing focused roles, having finally admitted to her, herself that she's a writer. Um, and she's curious if you have any recommendations for strategies for transitioning into writing from a global health background. So, you know, I think one, there are amazing like writing centers, writing classes, writing coaches, writing resources out there. So I would, you know, one of the things that I've really loved doing is, you know, either taking online or in-person writing workshops where I can meet and be around other writers. Um, critique groups are great. Um, if you have a project that you're working on, or even if you're just, you know, getting started, there are entire writing workshops on, so you don't know what you want to write about. Come to our writing workshop, and we'll spend the time trying to think about what we want to write about or, or what we're going to write about. So on the writing side, I think that's like important. And then on the communication side, there are a lot of. Um, I think that's one thing that I didn't say is that I do get to do a lot of creative things in my professional life, and so so I do you know a fair amount of communications work, etc. In public health, and so and so that has been a nice bridge between my like writing kind of the fiction writing, writing, and then, you know, also continuing to write, you know, as part of my, uh, part of my career path. So I would encourage you to find even like global health roles that are communications roles that can enable you to do that writing to, from a professional perspective, but also, you know, identify what, what projects are going to be your projects that you want to, work on just for you because you're really passionate about them.
Thank you, Patty. You certainly have said a, a number of times, I hope this resonates with people, the importance of finding your passion, right? So that you can find those things that are natural to you, exciting to you, and that then you can lead in them effectively. So I think that's a beautiful way for us to end. Um, Patty, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a real pleasure to hear your story uh, and to listen to your, your journey um, and to get some unique insights about your, your unique career path as well. Uh, for those of you who are still on, we would love for you to join our community. So we do try to do this series monthly. So uh, you can find what you can find out about when the next one is if you join our virtual Slack network. For those of you who aren't familiar with Slack, this is just a space where we chat, we share, we uh, share resources, we answer polls, maybe some of us post job opportunities, or we tell each other we're looking for jobs. It's a fantastic place uh, to network and, and stay engaged with one another. So please do join us. And if you haven't been to one of our networking events, we also host uh, virtual networking events on Gather, and we'll probably be doing one in the next few months. So again, big thanks to you, Patty, for being with us today and spending this time. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining us from all over the world. And with that, we'll end our session today. Thank you again. Great. Thanks, everyone.